Okay, so uh, thank you for our kind introduction. Um, as Seita-san said, um, I uh, have nothing related with AI-driven science or robot-related um, science. Um, I'm simply a, a biologist. And um, today I'm going to talk about um, how we can make human hibernate. And um, uh, I hope at the end of my talk, um, I know there are so many uh, specialists of uh, automated science and robotic science here. I'll be glad if you could give me some advice, uh, which part of my project or which aspect of my project would be uh, a suitable uh, for uh, automated science. Okay, so um, I'm interested in suspended animation or, or uh, synthetic hibernation. And as you can see, this is a kind of typical view or what people think what a, a suspended animation is. And this is exactly what I want to do to human. And of course, sci-fis are far ahead from the reality. Uh, still, we cannot make human hibernate. Um, but um, I was very much interested, in, became interested in this field um, with this uh, tiny creature. Uh, it was almost 15 years ago when I uh, run into this uh, small lemur. Uh, this lemur is the uh, fat-tailed dwarf lemur. Of course, they're lemurs, so they're living in Madagascar. Um, but these lemurs are, were the first primate to be reported as a hibernator. So I was so surprised when I looked, at to, look to, looked into these um, charts in the, in the paper. Um, the red lines are showing the body temperature of these lemurs. And I'll just... Uh, yeah, this is the uh, magnification of the last uh, chart. Uh, the red lines are the body temperature. And I was so surprised because uh, they do keep their body temperature around 36 degrees when they're in normal condition, uh, as we do, because they're mammals. But once they enter hibernation, all of a sudden they uh, keep their body temperature around 22 or 23 degrees. And that's surprising because uh, it's a killing temperature for human. Um, and uh, by the way, the, this white and black boxes is one day. So this means that these uh, lemurs are keeping their body temperature very low more than a week. So this uh, really surprised me. Uh, when I saw this uh, chart, I was working as a pediatrician uh, in a pediatric ICU. So I thought if we could uh, induce such uh, a hypometabolic or sorry, hypothermic condition in human, we will also uh, be possible, um, possibly induce hypometabolic condition to the patients. And that could save a lot of, save a lot of lives uh, because probably we could buy time for the patients until they reach to the hospital. And many things, many good things could be, uh, uh, could happen. So this is uh, my own uh, time, um, a plan schedule for uh, synthetic hibernation, or at least uh, within this 20 years, I would like to induce short hibernation for humans. And in, in the far future, uh, I believe that synthetic hibernation will be very um, useful for going to far extrasolar uh, travels or even uh, maybe if we could induce hibernation on demand, um, that could really uh, change our lifestyle. I, I, one of my goal is to change the meaning of sleep. Uh, now sleep is of course sleep, but maybe 60 years later, sleep will mean hibernate. Um, so I, I'm imagining that uh, we could um, uh, make hibernation every night. So uh, how we can do that, that's uh, what we are uh, tackling. So uh, today I would like to talk in three parts. And first of all, I'll just try to tell you uh, about what is already known about hibernation. And secondly, I will talk about what we are doing uh, to solve uh, or to understand hibernation science. And we are using mice which do not enter hibernation. And uh, finally, I would like to um, give you one example 
how um, using mice uh, for hibernation research will be um, useful, and especially for hibernation in medicine. So mammals, when they face hunger, of course they eat, uh, but some of them, they can't eat and they die. Uh, but several, few percent of mammals can enter a condition called torpor. And torpor, as you can see in this uh, video, they uh, suppress their metabolism and reduce their body temperature. And that way they can save energy. And when they're in normal condition, of course, um, all of you know that um, animals use oxygen and nutrients and produce energy. And those energies are used for a lot of series of vital functions. Um, but when the animal enter torpor, Interestingly, and this is from simple observation, their oxygen usage and uh, uh, consumption of nutrients are suppressed, which means that they will not be able to um, produce energy anymore. Then that will mean that they will not able to use those energies to uh, vital functions. And usually that will damage their body or cells or tissues but they're not damaged. So that's the most interesting part of torpor or hibernation. And if we could understand that mechanisms, I think uh, it will be a big uh, step forward for human hibernation or whatever animal which do not usually enter hibernation. So uh, this is sim a simple wording uh, problem, but um, a long torpor is called hibernation. So months of torpor are called, is called hibernation. And the shorter one, the hours of torpor, is called daily torpor. And there are so many uh, species uh, among the uh, mammal, uh, um, uh, in, in mammals, I mean, um, that probably we believe that uh, in, in, the, uh, in the past, maybe every mammal were able to enter hibernation. And now, of course, it's a warm, uh, uh, age, uh, many mammals lost their functions of uh, hibernation. So what is common in every um, torpor capable animal is that they lower their body temperature. Um, this uh, chart is showing a very typical uh, hibernator, um, uh, the 13 line ground squirrel. I think it's very popular in the North uh, America. Um, they have a very low body temperature during hibernation. As you can see, they have body temperature lower than 10 degrees. But the thing is, before they reduce their body temperature, they always reduce their metabolism first. So uh, this is a common thing in every hibernators. So they just reduce their oxygen consumption rate before the drop of body temperature, and then they drop their body temperature. So hibernators are not having uh, low metabolism because of their lower temperature, rather they have a lower body temperature because they suppress their metabolism. So when we are in healthy condition, um, we usually have a balanced energy supply and energy demand. And when we become sick, especially when we become sick acutely, um, the energy supply is damaged. For example, if you have a heart attack, your heart stops and your circulation stops and uh, your peripheral cells and tissues won't get enough oxygen or nutrients anymore, and you will eventually die. So modern medicine somehow tries to uh, recover, recover this energy supply. And that's another reason why if you have a delay on this um, recovery, you will be damaged. So how about hibernators? They also have a uh, uh, lack of energy supply because of simply they don't have food. So what they did is to uh, suppress their energy demand. And this could make another balance there and they could survive winter. Of course, this is not for free. Um, many hibernators, they can't move. Um, we believe that they don't have any consciousness. So they may be eaten by some other predators, but still they can survive such, uh, 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 I mean, a winter without much food. So we want to simply induce such a, a energy demand reduction in human, and that will be very beneficial for sick people 
sick patients, for example, uh, it will probably slow down the uh, disease or we could buy time, the, uh, buy time for patients until they reach to the hospital. So uh, to do that, probably we need to understand the natural hibernators uh, mechanisms, but there are so many things which is unknown. And there are so many questions in each uh, layers. For example, for an in, in organismal layer, we still do not have no idea how the brain is regulating um, such lowered and also controlled hypometabolism. We even don't know which part of the brain is awoke during hibernation. And um, in the organ or tissue level, we do not know how those organs or tissues are um, getting the signal or how they know when to enter torpor. For example, the heart keeps beating during hibernation, but the liver and the kidneys looks like they are almost totally stopped, uh, but we don't know why it happens. And probably the order of the uh, torpid state is very important. And finally, the, in the cellular level, um, we do not know why those cells are he looks healthy or they look okay, even in a very low uh, temperature or a very low oxygen consumption rate. So um, to, to understand such stuff, it's, it's um, the best way to do, the best way to do this research is to use hibernators. So six or seven years ago, when I started my research about hibernation, I just wanted to use these animals, but as you can see, these animals are not, uh, suitable for labs, right? And you have to go to the zoo instead. So, um, and, and there are also other reasons like um, uh, it's very difficult to uh, do a genetic modification to these animals. And the, the most, most critical reason was that hibernation, it's very difficult to induce them in hibernators. It, it, it's, it might sound like a joke, but it's true. Um, it takes months usually to induce a hibernation in hibernators. So uh, it's, it's not very efficient. So I uh, instead tried to use, uh, decided to use mice um, because they are very, uh, they're super available. Um, their genetic resources are wonderful and um, they do not enter hibernation, but they can um, enter a short torpor, which is called daily torpor by uh, fasting. So I, I prepared uh, such an environment and um, this is a, a refrigerator, a kind of uh, temperature control chamber. And we put the animals inside and recorded oxygen consumption rate and body temperature and tested many conditions and learned that while using this uh, famous C57BL6J mice, removing food is enough to induce daily torpor. Uh, if we fast them more than 16 hours, they will enter a condition called torpor, daily torpor. And if we return food, they just come back. And this is the trace of the body temperature or oxygen consumption rate during fasting induced torpor. And you can see that they show like uh, 22, uh, three or four degrees of body temperature, which is relatively low for a mammal. Now, um, what we, what, what, what surprised us was um, um, they have some, they had some uh, shared aspects of hibernation between fasting and use torpor and uh, hibernation. But the most different thing was the difference in the set point temperature. So usually mammals have a set point around 37 degrees, but um, hibernators, they have a huge drop in the set point temperature. But in mice fasting and use torpor, they didn't show any drop. So that means that they, even they show a very low body temperature, probably they are very cold. So uh, that's kind of different from uh, hibernators. And um, also one other issue was this torpor, fasting and use torpor is so short. It usually lasts, uh, I, I wrote here a few hours, but usually it only lasts for uh, 30 or 40 minutes. And um, that's very uh, not easy to use for experiment. So uh, we were deciding, we were thinking about what we should do, but until we found this mice. 
this, this mice was um, uh, developed with uh, my collaborator, Dr. Takeshi Sakurai in Tsukuba University. Uh, this mice now has a very low body temperature around 22 degrees for more than 24 hours. And he, he's healthy. This condition is called QIH. It stands for Q-neurons uh, induced hypometabolism. And it's induced by stimulating uh, a specific group of neurons in the hypothalamus. So uh, exciting, the Q neuron stands for QRFB peptide um, neurons. And if you stimulate these neurons, you can induce uh, a multi-day to one or two day uh, hypometabolism. And if you record the oxygen consumption rate, you can see that the temperature drops and oxygen consumption rate drops. And as I said in the introduction, uh, the torpid animals, uh, they usually have the drop in the oxygen consumption rate before the body temperature. And it's really, uh, this looks like a hibernator, a hibernation. And it can be repeated. And there are a lot of aspects, physiological aspects, which resembles uh, hibernation. Like they don't eat during their in torpor. And their vital signs like heart rate or respiration rate, they're really suppressed. And above all, uh, their um, reaction to the temperature was very similar to hibernators. So this mice is now in a normal condition and he's now in the ambient temperature of 28 degrees. He looks happy um, moving around and the body temperature is around 37 degrees. It's totally normal. normal. And when we induce QIH, all of a sudden it extends his posture. This means this guy is feeling hot, but the body temperature is around 30. He should be feeling cold. Uh, and when we decrease the uh, ambient temperature to 20, it's still uh, extending his posture, still feeling hot. And his body temperature is now 22 degrees. And if we go further, um, Finally, he starts to feel coldness and he's now sitting. And if we keep, uh, yeah, and by the way, the body temperature is 21 degrees. And if we keep this guy into the same temperature, uh, he needs to maintain his body temperature around 20. So he starts to shiver. This is very unusual for mice. Um, and if we return the room temperature to 28 degrees, it returns to the, uh, extended position, which means he's still feeling hot um, when in, in this ambient temperature and his body temperature returned to 30. So this is clearly showing that they, this, this QIH condition can change the uh, set point of the animal. And uh, indeed, when we estimated the drop, it was around eight degrees drop in the uh, set point temperature. Um, uh, this was a finding. And QIH uh, itself is now uh, very much used in hibernation research because of several reasons. As I said, it has a lowered set point temperature and hibernation research uh, using mice is also a very good aspect. And I think this is the most interesting part. You can induce this hibernation like status when you want it. So you, you can just inject a drug and you'll have this condition within 30 minutes. So now we are using this model to investigate what is going on in all parts of the body. And we hope that we can find some uh, um, pathways, which is really important for such safe uh, hypometabolism. Now, um, I just want to give you one example uh, how QIH is used in this field. So as I said in the introduction, I want to make human hibernate for some medical reasons. But one thing which is not known is, is it really true that hibernation can suppress the disease progression? And it's, uh, it's thought like that, but no one have tested that because it's very difficult to induce hibernation in hibernators. So now we have QIH, it's possible to test them. We decided to test uh, several diseases with QIH and see what happens. So we first chose uh, uh, sepsis. It's a, a, a systemic inflammation, which is basically based on um, bacterial infection. 
So many people die or are killed by sepsis every year. And this is a guideline for sepsis management, but basically you need to quickly treat them. So <clears throat> in mice, it's very easy to induce sepsis. You simply make a hole in the cecum. And it's also nice because um, you can control the severity by choosing a needle size or the position. So in, in this uh, study, we made a model which uh, mice uh, will die within 48 hours. And we tested how QIH will uh, change the uh, outcome. So here's the result. And the blue line is showing the normal, um, uh, normal survival curve of sepsis. So all, almost all mice are dead before 40 hours. And if you induce QIH, you can see a clear shift of the carb to the right, uh, which means QIH, simply inducing QIH could make the mice much more uh, tend to survive. And if you look at the inflammation markers in the, in the blood, uh, the IL-6 uh, concentration usually jumps up within 16 hours in sepsis, but in QIH, they don't uh, jump, go high as, they, as them. So it, it looks like QIH is simply suppressing uh, the sepsis inflammation. But this, this model is not real. I mean, in, in real, uh, in the hospital, patients become sick and then they come to the hospital. So uh, it's not like this. Usually they come when after they got bad. So we decided to test how much delay is um, acceptable for this treatment. And we did a four hour and an eight hour um, delay and found that um, at least four hour delay is acceptable. It shows almost the same um, delay as zero hour uh, QIH. So uh, th this will be the summary. Um, we are, uh, so yeah, first I, I talked about the hibernation biology. Um, the take home message of hibernation biology is that Hibernators are not cold because, uh, sorry, they are not uh, hibernating because of their lowered body temperature, but their body temperature is low because the animal actively suppresses their metabolism. And um, hibernation research in mice, I just showed you about the uh, QIH and um, we are now, uh, of course, QIH is an interesting model. Um, it's very easy to use. But it's kind. It's a bit different from hibernators. So now we are trying to induce the same uh, thing in the real hibernators. It's still uh, we are uh, keep trying to do that. And finally, I um, shows one example of using QIH um, and QIH, and we are now testing other disease as well. And as far as uh, we have tested, almost every acute disease will be delayed by QIH. Um, I think there will be a good, it will be a huge evidence for uh, um, making human hibernate in the future. So uh, thank you so much. And um, yeah, that, that's all. All right, open book question. So coach. Do you think hypometabolism would slow down aging? Um, thank you for a, a, a critical question. So far, uh, no one has tested that because as I said, hibernation, it's not basically inducible. Um, and I think it will um, slow down aging, uh, but I'm not sure whether it will be a good scenario because while you are in, hibernation, you will lose your consciousness. Um, and um, we don't know whether it will, it will be really beneficial, but we are now trying to test that in QIH model. Uh, we are inducing QIH every two weeks oh. and see how the mice will do two or three years later. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh major progress in research 
since I had your research four years ago. <laughs> yeah, huge congratulations on this. Well, a couple of questions. On this uh, QIH mouse, I think you intentionally making the temperature lower and lower. I think a mouse reacting to that. How similar is this with the natural hibernation mm -hmm. in natural environments? Uh, animals like bears, though, are they actually similarly uh, reacting? Probably this is very difficult to measure because it's kind of uh, have to measure in a natural environment. Uh, what, what's your take on this? That's the first question. Second question is this is septic thing. Is this because QIH or is this because of low temperature that actually says, you know, the whole entire process got slowed down? But that's why it's uh, got more like a survival ratio. But that's the second question. Third question is uh, more speculative. Like, uh, do you think like uh, any kind of autophagy is going on when this uh, is going on? Because, uh, yeah. Okay. So, questions. yeah. Right. So, uh, for, for the first question, um, at least for the uh, initiation part, it looks very similar to real hibernation. So, uh, almost all hibernators first drop their oxygen consumption rate and then their body temperature follows that. But the waking up part is very different, actually. Uh, and it's already known that uh, animals uh, have a much sharper uh, recovery. So they have some kind of mechanisms to uh, produce heat, even in a very, very low metabolic condition. So that's why we think that they have some part of the brain awoken, uh, even during hibernation. And that's not known yet. And the second question um, about the sepsis uh, study. Uh, yeah, it's probably a lot of part, a lot of the uh, reason why those animals don't die for a while is because they are hypometabolic, uh, sorry, hypothermic. But um, for example, if you give a deep anesthesia to a sepsis septic animal, if you're not so careful, you can even kill the animal with that. So uh, the, the, the hibernation is, uh, it looks like a simple hypometabolism or hypothermia, but the key is it is regulated. So the animal wants to keep in a certain level, uh, even they look like they're unconsciousness. So I think that's a big difference from simple hypothermia. And the third one was uh, the auto. Yeah, it's, it's known that some auto, autophagic system is um, uh, um, activated during hibernation, but it's not always. And uh, we are trying to look into this model too, but um, I don't have the answer yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A quick question. Uh, uh, well, I don't know if there's a quick uh, response, but in terms of your research here, uh, does it does this shed any light into how temperature compensation works for just regular circadian rhythms? Can you just say a little bit about that? Thanks. Sure. It's not our group, but another group is now trying to see how the circadian rhythms go during QIH uh, because there's not so many animals which can show a very low temperature, uh, which can we also look into the circadian rhythm. Sorry, my, my explanation is not good we can easily test whether the mice is having uh, what kind of subjective time they have through many technologies, uh, but we can't do that in hibernators. So people are very much interested in how the circadian rhythm will work the, uh, in these hypothermic animals. It's, it's on the way. So I actually don't know the answer, but probably in some range, the circadian rhythm will have a temperature compensation, but from uh, a certain level, probably it will be slowed down. Yeah. Okay, sure. The last question. Okay, you, if I understood correctly, you, you said that hibernation was uh, ancestral mam mammalian feature. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> what, what's the evidence for that? Um, well, at least from the studies from the uh, genes, probably there's no evidence that there, but um, I, I think that like uh, uh, 10,000 years ago, it was in the ice age and our mammals are all from that um, ice age. So it's beneficial to be in a hibernation. I mean, every mammals. So um, there's no clear scientific evidence for that, but uh, it's, it's simply a possibility. 
well, you know, 10,000 years ago, the tropics were still very warm. So it's... Uh, 10,000 years. Yeah. Was it? Ten? Sure. Yeah. 10,000. Wasn't it an ice age? Yes, but the tropics were warm. Tropics. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, you're not saying that, you're saying that the whole globe was not cold. Yes, of course. Uh -huh. Only like Europe in the north and the south, but not in the middle. Okay, okay. So, well, it's only a possibility. Um, uh, the mammals, um, so far, uh, there, there are certain, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just don't have a clear evidence for that right now. Okay, thanks. Right. So it seems that we give this project to the AI scientists and we should have an enter the 2060. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very inspiring talk.